Now, we cannot serve both Hippocrates and Hammurabi at the same time. They're very different roles. The clinical role is to serve Hippocrates, the healer. And this role is to relieve suffering, to provide treatment, and to prevent further illness or injury. So the clinician's role is to provide therapy, and the duty of care is to the patient. The forensic role is to serve Hammurabi, the lawgiver. And this role involves evidence gathering, which is a basic tenet of impartiality. So the role of the forensic physician, or the forensic scientist, is to provide expert opinion, and the duty of care is to the court. My forensic practice first started in Jamaica, where I was a police doctor there uh, in 1979, and then became a police doctor in the 1980s in Auckland. And I helped set up the Help Foundation, and I was involved in training women doctors um, nationwide for conducting forensic sexual assault examinations. I was also an honorary medical officer performing uh, child sexual assault examinations at the Princess Mary Children's Hospital in Auckland. This was our paediatric hospital before they built the Starship. I co-wrote a textbook with ESIR scientists, the f two forensic scientists, um, on conducting uh, medical sexual assault examinations. The organisation, the Doctors for Sexual Abuse Care, DZAC, was started in 1988 and was based on my, my work. And I was made an honorary life member. Now, the primary object of DZAC is clinical. It's to enhance the medical practitioner care of victims of sexual abuse. However, DZAC was set up to train doctors um, in, a forensic examin in doing forensic examinations. And between 1988 and 1993, I expressed concerns to DZAC about the advice they would give training forensic doctors that they must always believe the victim, validate the abuse, report normal findings as consistent with abuse, and that the doctor must be the child's advocate. Now, this is the role of the clinician. It's not the role of the forensic physician. And I believe we need to have a distinction between the therapeutic and the forensic roles. DZAC are the only forensic doctors for the Crown. And DZAC training is a requirement to conduct forensic sexual assault examinations for the New Zealand Police. In 1997, DZAC changed their constitution and rescinded my membership without reason or right of appeal. Subsequently, I'm excluded from attending DZAC training and from conducting forensic examinations. However, I still do appear for the defence on occasion. And therefore, I am accused of having an orientation towards disbelief of allegations of sexual abuse. And my response is that I neither believe nor disbelieve an allegation, that rape happens and false allegations can also happen. And as a forensic physician, my response is here is an allegation, maybe it's true, maybe it's false, what is the evidence? So the forensic role is to explore and interpret available evidence. And it's about evidence. It's not about belief and it's not about disbelief. I'm also being accused of being an apologist for rapists and making the world safe for paedophiles. And, and my response to this is that I've examined many women and children who've been raped and sexually abused. And, and I shouldn't need to have to say this, but you know, rape and sexual abuse of children is abhorrent. However, not all people are necessarily guilty. People are entitled to a fair trial and they're innocent until proven guilty. So one of, the, one of the things I think is important as a forensic physician is that before a trial, we should talk about a complainant, not a victim, and an accused or a defendant, not an offender. And that both clinical and forensic physicians clearly should treat complainants with compassion and respect. But we should also afford the same treatment when dealing with the accused. Appearing for the, I, I don't appear for the defence lightly. Um, I don't find it fun, and it, and it is taking its toll. Anyway, on to education. The network of schools of alchemy have existed for over 2,000 years in ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia, on through India and Persia in the Far East, and then classical Greek and Roman times, medieval Islamic world, and finally medieval Europe. And so in this tradition, the science and the art of alchemy was passed down to students from master alchemists.
My job description for the Goodfellow Chair includes providing academic leadership for and excellence in postgraduate programs within the Department of General Practice and Primary Health Care through visionary and innovative approaches. My revision of our courses and programs follows the same model of combining scholarship and professionalism. So our postgraduate programs need to impart skills and knowledge of best practice within their specialties, be they sports medicine, community emergency care or palliative care. All clinical disciplines require a commitment to lifelong learning. The postgraduate education needs students to ensure that they have tools to access and critically appraise new knowledge as research progresses and to assess the quality of that evidence and its relevance to their own practice. And this knowledge then needs to be implied in the context of individual patients. And professional expertise requires self-reflection and assessment of the outcomes of our decisions. So for postgraduate students, they need to be able to look at the research knowledge from populations and then ask, should this knowledge confirm or change my practice? Are these findings realistic? Is this test or intervention available? Will it be used? Will it be worthwhile? Is it to this particular patient? How does it apply to other conditions, patients with other preferences? And what are the relative gains and risks for my patient? I'm currently working with Dr. Sue Wells and Jill Robb, both of whom are here tonight, and to develop a mandatory core paper for all our programs, which we're going to be piloting in 2011. Called Evidence in Practice, it covers literature review, critical appraisal, and research methodology to equip students to understand emerging research and assess its value with respect to their own practice. Students will then explore their own and other colleagues' clinical reasoning and decision-making in specific scenarios. This will enable them to reflect on the weight they give different components, such as explaining relative risks and harms, issues relating to the law, to equity, and to human rights and dignity. And following this model, the integration of scientific and contextual evidence will be a component of all our postgraduate courses delivered from the Department of General Practice and Primary Health Care. And finally, once we have research knowledge, we need to disseminate it. And the philosophy of alchemy has been around for over 2,000 years. And the alchemists will record their findings in texts and scrolls and disseminate them in alchemist schools and in their libraries. Bruce has already mentioned this, but my main uh, means at the moment of dissemination of knowledge is as the editor of the Journal of Primary Health Care. The previous um, Royal New Zealand College of GP Journal, New Zealand Family Physician, was retired in 2008 after 35 years. And in March 2009, I became the founding editor of the Journal of Primary Health Care. So my aim was to produce a rigorous peer-reviewed journal that's Medline listed and attracts research from a number of primary care specialties, including general practice, nursing, um, community pharmacy and public health. And this interdisciplinary approach is in line with the team-based focus of the primary health care strategy. The journal includes a focus on Maori, Pacific and Asian issues and it's positioned to be relevant to countries within the Pacific Rim. But as well as publishing original research, the Journal of Primary Health Care acts as a knowledge refinery to provide busy practitioners with up-to-date knowledge about the latest evidence and practice. There's a number of regular columns. One of these is the string of pearls. Pearl stands for practical evidence about real-life situations, and it's something that Bruce and uh, several other members of the Primary Care Cochrane Group uh, have initiated. And e each pearl is the bottom line and the, of the conclusion of a Cochrane review. And a string of pearls is when we link them into a theme. So we have the bottom line, that, that particular uh, string has seven pearls that are all to do with the treatment of back pain. So that's seven Cochrane reviews distilled into one column. In another um, regular uh, uh, column in the journal is, the, um, is charms and harms which is, um, presents the evidence of the potential benefits and possible harms of one well-known herbal medicine per issue. This is the sort of information that uh, primary care GPs and nurses 
uh, have generally have very little access to. But the Journal of Primary Healthcare acknowledges that while the scientific evidence can help inform best practice, sometimes there's no evidence at all available or not applicable to a specific patient with his or her own set of conditions, beliefs, expectations and social circumstances. And again, evidence needs to be placed in context. So the quality of care lies also with the nature of the clinical relationship, with communication and with truly informed decision making. Therefore, the Journal of Primary Health Care also publishes viewpoints, commentaries and reflections that explore areas of uncertainty, of ethics, of aspects of care for which there is no one right answer. There's also a regular ethics column with a guest ethicist in each issue. Another feature of the journal is the back-to-back -back debates. Um, each issue has a back-to-back -back debate where there's two professionals who present their opposing views on a moot. Uh, this might regard an ethical, a clinical or a political issue. Bruce has stolen my thunder, but the Journal of Primary Healthcare was granted Medline listing on the basis of its first four issues. And uh, the seventh issue was published uh, in September this month. Now to date we've had over 200 authors and over 130 people have been reviewers of papers and books. So, I mean, this is very much a team approach and I'm incredibly grateful to all those contributors who together have made the journal such a success. In the journey from apprentice to master, we gain knowledge and practical wisdom along the way. And the sorcerer knows how to correct his novice's mistake. If only it were this easy. <laughs> in summary, clinicians, researchers and teachers are all on a journey of lifelong learning. They're constantly adding and re-evaluating knowledge so that we can practice the very best we can. In conclusion, I'd like to acknowledge all those who've supported me over the years in this journey. In particular, my husband John Potter, without whose support I would not have been able to progress my career in this way. I also like to thank my family, my friends and colleagues who've guided me and helped me along the way and to the Goodfellow Foundation and the University of Auckland in supporting me in my role. And lastly, I wish to pay tribute to my mother, Mari Goodyear Smith. She inspired in me the love of learning, a passion for challenges and a strong sense of adventure. Here she is a few years ago at the age of 88, about to loop the loop for the first time in a tiger moth. <laughs> she resigned from her full-time job last year at the age of 91, but she's not yet fully retired. <laughs> so if I follow in her footsteps, I'll be working until I'm 90. So there's much further still to go. Thank you. <laughs>